Hello and welcome back to Kentucky Route Zero TV Edition. I did a very bad thing because I haven't played this in a while, so I don't remember what happened in it, which means I don't know where we're jumping in. This game is just so wonderfully dense that I'm worried I'm gonna miss something. Let's look at my notes. Oh, that's right, I have the IOU from the Hard Times Distillery. That's right. Drafting, Graf ruled, Shannon Marquez. Smells continues. So much coffee, burning computers, poison, baking bread, booze. Interesting. Interesting. I like the fact that I have something of hers in there. Okay, so I know that I went through my experience with Xanadu. So I think what I'm doing now is possibly going to one of two places. I either want to go to the convenience store that I never went to when I think I said that I wanted food. I also need to go to the distillery and I guess I need to go to the Rust Archives. All right, I do have something here in my notes about going to Consolidated. Maybe I'll do that before I do the one that's actually in my notes. Because the things that aren't in my notes, those are the things I want to experience because those are the things that, you know, you only get to experience if you're paying attention to the game. The bureau should be somewhere over here, right? Yeah, there we go. Okay, great. So from here, let me do the thing. Consolidated, we're going to go to the scarecrow clockwise. Okay, and then you turn to the bat feeder. Okay, and it's counterclockwise, right? It's not giving me a U. Oh, whoops. Yes, this might be it. It says it's on the right, office building. The account resolution center is several hundred feet above the ground, precariously supported by a dozen metal pipes. The wires of a pulley system run down from a hole in the floor. A thin rope dangles next to them. Tug on the rope. Shannon tugs on the rope a few times. After a few still moments, the pulley wires grind into operation, and a metal bucket slowly descends. While she watches the bucket approach, Shannon's mind wanders. She wonders if Weaver is down here somewhere on the Zero, and what she might say about it. Probably something about its topology, its knotted surface. She remembers a puzzle Weaver enjoyed as a teenager about bridges and islands. Move between the islands, crossing each bridge once and only once. Weaver filled sketchbooks drawing these islands and bridges from memory, trying different routes. Eventually, she moved on to other puzzles. Had she solved it? Given up? Or maybe she'd just drawn those bridges and islands so many times that she no longer needed paper and pencil to work on it. The pulley stops abruptly as the bucket reaches shoulder height. Inside is a handwritten note. Regrettably indisposed. Please call again. Oh, tag on it. Okay, so I think that was the right place that I meant to go to, but it seems like they're presently indisposed. Let's see if there's somewhere else I can go. What happens at the sandwich? Ooh, to the 84. Sorry, I just want to explore a little bit. <laughs> it's been so long since I've played that I'm just getting back into the groove of it. And these are symbols I haven't seen. So I think the 84 is something I haven't driven on yet. Yeah, that goes back to the 65. Oh, children. Four children roam the shore of an underground river, collecting handfuls of mud and rocks and depositing them in a metal bowl close to the water. Ezra fills his hands with water and brings it to the bowl. One of the children smiles gratefully and washes some of the stones. Another leans over the bowl, pretending to smell it, and nods in satisfaction. The children sit cross-legged around the bowl. They fold their hands, bow their heads, and mumble some nonsense. One of them looks up and waves Ezra to sit nearby. Okay. Interesting. So that was counterclockwise from the sandwich? <laughs> All right, so these are some of the places I want to go. I still want to go to the convenience store. I still want to go to the arcade as well. So I have to get back to the 65 regardless. Oh good, it is here. It has the consolidated power office. So I did go to the right place. So I guess all of the places that I jotted down, the game also did jot down for me. So I want to do this one too. I want to go back to the Rust archives. All right, so I got to get back to the 65. So let's try to do that because I want to go back to some of the other things. 4641. What the hell is that? 
Is this the same children? About a dozen children are gathered in the shallow, dry basin to the side of the road. They are seated on overturned pots and pans arranged in three configurations. One group of five children are clustered to the right. One group are arranged loosely in the center, all facing an older girl who sits on three pans stacked together. The boy at the head of the arrangement looks sternly down on another child, a younger boy kneeled on the stone floor without a pot to sit on. A spare stock pot, perhaps belonging to the younger boy, is set to the side. Hmm, I'm going to stand next to the one that seems like he's being singled out. Ezra stands next to the younger boy. The older girl nods solemnly to Ezra. The older girl takes a wide, green leaf from the floor next to her and pretends to read off a list of charges. The younger child is accused of making agreements for trading card exchanges which he was not able to honor. The judge asks for a witness to testify. A boy describes the participants and events depicted on the trading card he was to receive and makes related claims about the defendant's nature. <laughs> Ezra is prompted to argue on behalf of his client. Ezra makes a case for mistaken identity. The judge invites the jury to examine the defendant more carefully. The defendant slyly rearranges his hair. The jury is sequestered a few feet away and returns with a verdict of not guilty. The groups of children reconfigure themselves and a new trial begins with the former defendant now as judge. Cute, interesting. So it occurred to me as I'm playing this, whichever one I hover on, if it makes a certain sound, that lets me know that I can actually do a U-turn to a certain route. See, this takes me to 259. And the thing is, I would just sit here off camera and basically try to map the zero, but I don't want to end up missing anything that you might want to see, assuming you're one of like the three people that cares about this. <laughs> There's a ladder, okay. The cave wall is uncommonly flat here. A tall ladder leans against the wall. At the top, a small figure taps away at something. Junebug pulls the bike next to the ladder. The woman at the top of the ladder seems unperturbed, focused on her work. Johnny switches to a telescopic lens. She has a pile of small, brightly painted clay tiles next to her on the ladder. She sticks each one to the wall with some kind of mortar or glue, inspects it, then taps gently at its edges with a small hammer until it's fixed in place. She's only a few dozen tiles along, too early to guess what kind of image might be taking shape. This recording can go in the art and artist drawer. Weird. The bottle takes me to the 259. The TV takes me to the 70. Uh, but I don't wanna go there yet. 8192. All right, let's head back to the bureau because I'm gonna have them bring me back to the main road. I forgot I could do that. Then I'm gonna go visit Carrington. Act three, scene 13. Bureau of Reclaimed Spaces. Yeah, I really wanna map the zero now because it's funny, only having been away from the game for this long, do, oh, look at you, Bugs, switching her little hips. But yeah, only having been away from the game for this long and getting back on the zero again, did I realize that I guess I can go to different routes depending on where I U-turn. So maybe I can map the zero, but let's go talk to everyone first. Of course, you're up, Blue. Oh, I'm Shannon now. Hey, you see that cat over there? Think she needs some bread? Maybe we should leave a crust or two behind and she'll go for it when she's comfortable. All right, thanks, Johnny. All right, I guess Junebug's coming with me. I'm sorry, Junebug? Is Junebug a robot? Why does she sound like that? Oh, Junebug, I'm very uncomfortable with that because I don't remember you making that noise before. Junebug, stop, don't follow me. I'm very creeped out. <laughs> I am genuinely creeped out. Junebug was definitely not robotic before. Hey, Lula. Here you are. Marianne has the rest of the evening off, so I'm minding the desk. You're not too busy? If I'm in the middle of something, I just let the phone ring. It's soothing in a way. The results just came in by courier. Good news. Donald and his assistants were able to sort through the noise. I had Rick cross-reference their results against some of our records. He found a corresponding mail stop on the Echo River route. Okay, so let's write that down, Echo River. 
As it happens, the night ferry is scheduled to make it stop here shortly. The ferryman carries the mail and collects the garbage as well. I'm sure you can catch a ride out that way. You're welcome to wait here. I have to get back to packing. Are you going somewhere? I might. I'm feeling impulsive, and I'd like to be ready. Maybe back to Mexico. It's been years. They still have one of my sculptures in a museum down there, did you know? Big, ugly iron thing. Time to have it scrapped anyway. Safe travels. Try to stay out of the water. It's colder than it looks. And deep. Okay, cool. Oh my god, Junebug, I'm so scared of you. Fine, I guess we'll wait. How long do we wait? Oh, who knows? All right, what happened? It's up to you. It's okay. You can tell them. Doesn't matter anymore. Oh, that's right. Because in the episode where we came out at the graveyard, Shannon and Conway went into a church or something on their own. And then they just ran out of there. They were like, let's go. <laughs> let's get out of here. And they didn't say anything. So now I guess that's what they're going to talk about. But what I was going to say is I'm not bothered by Junebug being a robot. I'm bothered by the fact that she wasn't a robot before which makes me wonder what happened. <laughs> anyway, fine. All right, explain what happened. So, we were in that graveyard. Okay, it's going to do a flashback. Act 3, scene 14. Where the strangers come from. That's so cool that they call back to this, because I really was curious what they saw in there, and I totally forgot about that. Yep, here we all are. What if I say something different this time? It's muddy. Yeah, that's what he said. Crystals and then mud. Okay. I know what I said back then, but I'm just curious, so I'm going to say the opposite. Okay. I'll stay with him. We can look for lizards. Okay, we'll make it quick. All right, so that just expedited things. Cool. look at the floor the church floor is cold metal scuffed and flexed by unknown boot heels a handmade apparatus for the production of moonshine assembled from scavenged metal and natural materials okay Let's sit down, see what happens. I don't know what I expected. The strangers, he kept saying. Kind of vague already, isn't it? Donald's a stranger. Hell, you and I are practically strangers. I don't consider you a stranger anymore, Shannon. We've been through a lot. Listen, earlier in the mine, I didn't want to talk about it, but what did you find down there? When I saw Weaver, she was on TV. I was testing a pretty simple tube repair, flipping through channels to check the saturation, and she was just there. It was kind of horrible. I mean, I told you she disappeared, suddenly, ran away, but we thought, what was she doing on TV? That's the part that I can't... I'd flipped past that channel a dozen times before my test. It was one of those public access things, some old lady reading poetry. And then, the next time I flipped to channel two, Weaver. It's burned in my vision now. She's standing in a room. The walls are a blank kind of gray. There's tape on the walls, like markings and desks. A classroom, maybe? The camera is in the corner, so it's this sort of 45 degree angle into the room. And there's Weaver right in the center of the picture. I stopped turning the dial. Hell, I think I stopped breathing. Eventually, she spoke, but there was no real sound. Just this awful hum. I read the closed captions. She said to go to the mine. I'd find something there. I can't remember her exact words. Whenever I try, I get distracted. Fuzzy. I... <coughs> so dusty in here, right? I hadn't noticed. Maybe it's me. I'm kind of allergic to... What the hell was that? Did you hear that? 
We should... Whoa! Cool. Also, writing in my notes. Channel 2. Weaver in room saying go to lines. <laughs> I love this game so much. I love taking notes like the little nerd I am. All right, let's go. Oh no, I'm this freakazoid. That's bizarre. The stranger activates the tape player slung on his shoulder. A crackly drawl echoes in the room and it sounds like it should be smiling. My regrets. I hope I didn't keep you waiting long. We don't see a lot of foot traffic these days. I guess you're here about the job. I'm afraid we only have one opening at the moment. Horrible business. You know what, let me ask about the job first, because I can get information hopefully about Xanadu after. What's this job? Certainly. I'll tell you everything you need to know. I've only just met you, but I feel certain there's a place for you here. I'll just take you over to meet the dispatcher, show you the trucks, get you familiarized. We can converse as we go. What is this place? Well, it's not an old church. <sighs> no, I guess not. But still, it all has a kind of reverence to it. And what's that smell? Like bread? Baking bread? Please, follow me. Oh, and look at that. Like my leg is glowing, just like his body's glowing. Service door 2E. I didn't expect this. I have to ask you to step in here a moment. This is for your safety. And adjust your outfits just a bit. There's some protective headwear up on the wall back there. Please remove your shoes and eyeglasses. Oh, and that's why when we went to the... I'm sorry, I feel like I'm being very loud. But I'm just so excited to be back playing this game. That's why when we went to the lower depths, when we looked at the dumpster, there were pairs of eyeglasses and shoes. We don't wear glasses, so that won't be an issue. Well, do us a favor and put on the headwear anyway, just this way. Okay. So they had to take them off, but because it's protective? Oh, cool. What? Did I just use the degausser on him? Interesting. That's so bizarre. Oh my God, this game. Hold on a second. All right, I had to go grab some ibuprofen because my tooth hurts. Let's take a look here. Wow, check this stuff out. It must be decades old, but it's in perfect condition. How do you think they keep it like that? Maintenance, old man. I bet it's someone's job around here. Probably hard to keep all the dust out, you know, underground. That's why I got into this business, to keep old stuff like this running. Seems like such a shame to let it just fall into ruin, you know? Like that computer back in the cave, Xanadu. Decades of engineering, thousands of years of mathematics and philosophy, all petrified into living stone. How could you just let that fall apart? Chew that, girl. Diggles. Oh, shit! Uh... This is Earl. He used to be a beekeeper. Borrowed some used casts to store the hives, but the interest accrued more quickly than the honey. Now he works for us here in logistics. Wait, if I do that again, will I be able to see more people? No, I want to see all of these people. Also, are they all dead? That's weird, though. How come I can only see them after doing that? More new arrivals this evening. Plenty to do. Gotta relay the formula. What formula? Eh? Oh, the formula. Changed our lives. Once, years ago, we were as prisoners to the intricacies of our debts here. We'd have to account for everything on paper. Compounding interest by hand, reassessing amortization, and leverage asset distributions according to nightly merit decay. God, that was a hard sentence to say. Then she stepped out of the dark caves to show us the light of the formula. She had a brilliant grasp of mathematics and a saint-like way of speaking right through the numbers. Wait. Now we just plug our daily numbers into the formula and run it all through the adding machine. We occasionally suffer some surplus drift, but she instructed us all on the necessary adjustments. 
It was devastating to see our revered mathematician go, but she was needed elsewhere. Her legacy abides. What job are they working? I don't know that it's been settled just yet. You see, sometimes we take on newcomers already in debt to the distillery. One of the foremen will find something for them to do. Chip away at their sum until it's all settled. That's what I'm doing here. Chipping away. That's what we're all doing. I hope I don't miss a chance to talk about the computer. I just want to really learn about everything else. I'll look at the shuttle in a second. Oh, it's not letting me go over there. Okay. God, this is fascinating. Here's the fleet. <laughs> oh, we just use these to get around internally. What do you do here? Oh, I'm a copywriter. Text on bottles and flyers, ad copy, that sort of thing. Discerning shades and heartsick lovers have long known the taste of hard times and held it in favor over all other spirits. That was one of mine. So the trucks are just east a ways in shipping. You can become acquainted with the dispatcher there. Give me a tap on the shoulder if you see something that catches your eye. Always happy to show off the facilities. Sublime machinery. Okay, I get to go to shipping, but I can just drive around too. <laughs> Here we go, Skelly. And it's amazing to me that all of this happened while I was standing outside as Ezra. Oh, I can get out. Okay, nice. Let's look at the warehouse. Feel that draft of warmth like a summer breeze. This is the aging warehouse. How many casks have you got aging in there? I couldn't say exactly. Take a look at the inventory report later if you like. Plenty, though. Of course, we only have half our aging stock in there at any given time. Most distilleries let their whiskey sit in casks through the cycle of seasons. In summer, the wood expands and the whiskey seeps in, picking up flavor. In winter, the wood contracts and squeezes the whiskey back out. Down here, there are no seasons. Each workday proceeds from the last in an unbroken chain of climate control. So we make our own seasons. Each cask alternates in a weekly cycle between the cold ground upstairs and this heated warehouse. Interesting. Computers. Please don't touch anything. Very sensitive devices. We're not even allowed to run the formula through them. What do they do? Temperatures, pressures, wear, tear, acidity, supply levels, any and all attending numbers in need of crunching, and so on. Am I boring you yet? Are you simply dying of boredom? <laughs> I myself could discuss this matter past sunrise. Ready to go. Of course, let's move on. Yes. Let's talk to Ted. How's it looking, Ted? Get that new fan installed? Ted met one of our engineers at a bar some years ago, and they just clicked. Our engineer told him about some trouble with the equipment here, and he felt compelled to take a crack at it. Ted's been obsessively tuning, replacing, and upgrading ever since. Quite a project, Ted. You'll get ahead of it one day, I'm sure. Okay. And the other person here... Danny. How goes the mystery, Danny? Danny's an enigma. He leases an old van from our fleet for some kind of daily art project. He drives out every morning and comes back by evening smelling of propellants. Can't afford the lease in cash, so he pays us with work here. More of these old computers. Looks like about the same vintage as the stuff in the cave. What's this little screen for? Oh, wow, good eye. This is an XY monitor. It's... Uh, they use them in oscilloscopes in arcade games. Or they used to, anyway. It's rare stuff. Hey, is this like antiquing with Lysette for you? <laughs> I probably sound kind of ridiculous, waxing on about vacuum tubes and oscilloscopes. It's good to have a passion. Yeah, I guess it is. Someday you'll have to tell me what yours is. Now, I'm wondering something here. We've talked to Earl, Danny, and Ted, right? I'm curious if those were the names that I saw on the headstones. No, okay, no. I had Kyle, Madeline, Sam, Joshua, Jeff, and Nicholas. Okay, but still, it was worth checking. It's interesting that he doesn't mind being degaussed by me. So I guess these are like before and after? I wonder what they keep the old casts around for. They smell nice for a little while, but it's pretty overpowering. No way around that smell. Those are caskets. I just noticed. Okay, 
No way to clean them after the aging process. I mean, it's a one-way street. So we're literally drinking the pain of others, like the sorrow of debt and oppression. That is what they're distilling. White lightning in a copper bottle. Ha, some folks have other names for it. What's it taste like? Like a revelation, my friend. Oh, you wouldn't want to drink it at this stage. Not that you could get a hold of any here. That's what the safe is for. Look at the neck, like a swan's, eh? This design is part of our legacy. The vapor passes up through this neck along just such a contour so as to produce our bourbon's signature character. Mr. Bishop always said the shape came to him in a dream. He shot awake in the middle of the night and set to work hammering an old tea kettle to match that phantom geometry. Believe what you will. Here, the vapors pass through a coil submerged in cold water and condense. Again, the geometry is very particular. Mr. Bishop arrived by intuition at a series of mathematical relationships between the angles and magnitudes here. Some weird cacophony of ratios. Well, those principles are lost to history now. Moving along. All right. Don't let them catch you looking too closely here. Not within our purview. What's it for? Keeps us honest in the eyes of the state. Well, in the eyes of the management anyway. We keep pretty well out of view down here. Not much chance of being spotted by helicopter, eh? But if the law came knocking, we could say we're logging and securing our virgin spirits. We could say. Marvelous engineering though, isn't it? I don't understand. Hey, Connie. Connie, how's your rat? Connie's a great lover of animals. Do you know she's adopted over a dozen pets in as many of the last years? Of course, death comes to all things great and small. The distillery found that the remains in her makeshift pet cemetery were trespassing on our subterranean property. Our hand was forced. In order to avoid the legal extinguishment of our easement, we were required to file a civil suit. Ever the level head, Connie agreed to a pre-court settlement to pay off her fines by working for us here. I... God, this is all so very depressing. <laughs> all right, we're at the malting and bottling. Let's see. What's up these stairs? Dig off. Oh. Smell that? No mistaking it. Baking bread. Exactly. That's the work of our unique ingredient, the yeast. The story is that Mr. Bishop got it from a baker in Knoxville in a little tin box. He was on our run, our Mr. Bishop, from the law. For a while, he hid out in some muddy swamp, subsisting on live fish, but he always kept that little tin box dry, held above his head. Some among us have proposed that a bit of swamp water seeped in that little tin box, introducing a foreign element and giving our yeast culture the eccentricity for which it's so widely known. I think it was that baker in Knoxville. They arrested him years later for the possession of controlled substance. <laughs> Life in prison. Solitary confinement. No visitors. No windows. Till the day he died. Must have been a hell of a substance, eh? This is where most of our staff ends up. Pretty modern equipment. Oh, absolutely. Top of the line machinery. A dramatic improvement. We used to bottle everything by hand, but these machines are marvelously effective. Made things a bit complicated for the workers. After all, the distillery can't just fire them. How then would they settle their accounts? But there's nowhere else to put them. They keep an eye on things here. Can't be paid as much just to watch, of course. Well, that's progress for you. Degoss. Wow. Hey, Cliff. This is Cliff in bottling. Did you know? Well, how could you? Cliff was behind bars not long ago. He placed a desperate advertisement in a local newspaper seeking assistance on his bail. The distillery put up the money, and now he's working it off while his case hovers in bureaucratic limbo. Jeez, this... Oh boy, this is something. Ooh, wait, will I get to swap out the truck? Hold on. Dig off. Interesting. Here it is. Now I have to ask, as a matter of course, what kind of experience do you have driving trucks? I used to drive long hauls. It's a lonely kind of thing, or so I hear. And you can drive safely, can't you? I haven't any doubt now. It's only after what happened with Miguel this evening. What happened with Miguel this evening? Well, the dust is still clearing, of course. <laughs> Perhaps he closed his eyes a moment, or simply hit a curve too devilish. I do pity ill-fated Miguel. 
He was good company and slow to anger. But if we're speaking confidentially... Well, with all that lost product to be repaid, bourbon and glass dashed across the interstate, and a few casks too, we're all just thankful he had no next of kin. So, let's see if we can bring up the dispatcher. Okay, well, I don't want to do that just yet. Uh, okay, looks like I have no choice. Doolittle starts the truck and switches on the CB radio. A deep, monotonous voice drones from the dashboard speaker. 1020 on that low, come back. Up in the Humberg Cave, 1012 City Kitty. This is a good time, dispatch. We may have found Miguel's replacement. Thought you might like to get acquainted. 10 non come again. Introduce yourself. Uh. Tell dispatch something impressive about yourself. They're very well regarded here. You folks know anything about a moldy old computer? 99 wheel holder, gotta pay the water bill. Ah, so. I'm certain they'll call back before long. Let's take a look around the truck, eh? Okay. Looks like it's just about ready to go out. We have some good, strong folks in the shipping here, so you never need to worry about loading if you don't want to. Bit hard on the knees and back at our age, eh? Of course, you'll have to unload at the destination, but that's the job. And some drivers like the extra shift stacking and loading here. I really shouldn't do any lifting these days. I see. Well, surely we can spare a dolly and carrying strap for your health and safety. Wait, what? I can say that it sounds like a lot of work, or I can say that he woke up on bailed hay. Let's go with this one. I think he might be having another episode. Conway woke up on bailed hay. Everything was too bright. His head hurt. The usual. Lizette and Ira argued loudly just outside the open barn door. She wanted Ira to take him inside and shower, have some coffee, get to the job. Ira said there wasn't time. Conway was in no condition. It was an important job. They couldn't put it off. Ira said to let the deadbeat sleep it off and then send him packing. He said Charlie could do the job. Conway closed his eyes. They kept arguing. Lizette tried saying Charlie had schoolwork, that Conway could be roused. Ira said Charlie should earn his bed for the summer. Conway was a lost cause. Couldn't show up to a job bleary-eyed and smelling like booze. Ira was a stubborn man. So Charlie went along. And Conway drifted out again, and he didn't hear about the accident until months later. So what's next? Let's look at the tires. Oh, sure, I know you'll want to look. Kick the tires. That's the thing we do, isn't it? As though our knees could exert the kind of force these tires see out there on the road. We're more likely to hurt ourselves. Isn't it the way? Sure, they're big machines, but they can be fragile. Absolutely. A truck deserves care and fearful respect, like a glass elephant. Miguel was a good driver, but he didn't have that quality of deference. Conway sat in a dim room full of folding chairs. The walls and ceiling were painted with old smoke. Someone read from the book. He drank coffee as it is. He listened. The speaker listed all the things we tried. That we. Most people in the room were probably there by court order. A few others shared. They spoke in abstractions like a program of action, a good orderly direction, spiritual but not religious, religious but not spiritual, all the things we tried. Then it was over. They clasped sweaty hands through a short prayer and stepped back out into the morning. He started walking. He was always walking these days. It was good to slow down. It felt clarifying, like a walking meditation. The road ran by a creek for a while. He took an unforeseen detour where the creek and road parted, following the edge of the water. He skipped a few stones, alone, then stopped to consider an overturned boat. It was a kind of serenity, that wandering and looking without purpose. He was coming to rely on those moments. Now what else can we show you? An overturned boat. Didn't we mention an overturned boat? Was it when I was playing the game? And I think I made him go out to something and he said he saw a boat and he instinctively reached for his flask and then he remembered that he didn't drink anymore? Huh. Headlights. Headlights work fine, you see? Do a little fiddles with the controls. That's important. Most of our product goes out at night. You never know who you'll run into in the daylight, and dust can be treacherously misleading with all that indirect light. The magic hour, eh? 
Travers sleep in the day then? Sure, those that sleep. Miguel pulled extra day shifts when he could. Sometimes he'd help me, you know, sometimes over in bottling. He shouldn't have been out driving at dusk. Weird shadows, soft light, dangerous. Conway had to get off the highway. Too loud, too murky. He turned off into some gray cornfield in Indiana. He watched traffic and birds. Seeing those migrations close up, they looked random. He thought about the load in the trailer. Thousands of plastic cups. Somebody wanted those cups in Rockford that night. It wasn't going to happen. He was only human. He'd been out since the headlights were on. Didn't even stop for coffee. He cracked a beer at three, eyes on the road. Half past four, he dodged some stray cattle. The headlights were coming back on. Rockford could wait. Early morning couldn't be much worse than late night. What could they care? He just needed a few hours. So, moving on. Control the wipers with this knob here. Do little fiddles. They seem to have a decent torque to them, eh? Can't say how they fare in an ice storm, but we must never delay a shipment. Better to assume the risk. You folks watch the weather? I wouldn't know it if I saw it. Too many years of climate control. Have I mentioned I rarely, if ever, leave our facility? I wouldn't know the rain if it drowned me. They ditched class for the day to drive in the rain. It was pointless to stay, all review. He was a lost cause, and she didn't need it anyway. She was smart, bored. It was time to cut out. Shitty day for it, though. 83 and biblical flood. They went to see a movie. It was some anonymous swashbuckler film about real men and women. Real tights, real lips, fake blood. They brought a flask. They smoked cigarettes, drank awful hooch, whistled buckets of rain. She sang about someone she wanted once to have loved. Brown hair curled around her ear. She had a voice like scotch whiskey. They poured another drink. And another. And another. She worried it was getting dark out. Then it was getting light out. They ended up in someone else's field. In someone else's car. An early morning joyride. And a sunrise collision. She got on the bus and he hiked back to his car. He sat in his car and went over some options. Chicago, Toronto, Barrow. It seemed like a bold and impulsive gesture at the time. As he pulled out of the parking lot, he removed his hands from the steering wheel for a moment and felt the car drift into a decision. Years later, he'd think of this as the moment he himself started drifting. A modest technology, but suited to the job, eh? Plenty good enough. So before I hit radio, I just want to say that I did notice, for anyone who's been watching this, if you noticed, that he described her voice. When I'm assuming that he's talking about Lizette here, though maybe he isn't. But he described her voice as sounding like scotch whiskey. And that's how Junebug described the voice of the woman that sang in the tavern that she learned that song from. So I'm guessing Lizette was that woman. It's so interesting that everything is coming full circle. Anyway, radio. The truck's radio crackles back to life. My tooth is killing me. Driver, come back. Ah, there's dispatch. Now tell them about your experience. Tell them the truck's in good shape. Tell them you start in the morning. I really can't. Yeah, we've got to finish this delivery in a few... 10.33 dispatch. Got two black eyes and a flock of crocodiles. Come back. 10.4. Back it down and prick your eyelids, driver. Come back, Lim. 10.4. Come back, wheel holder. Uh, 10-4. Got your ears on? Good. Listen to this. So... I think that went well. Let's head back up to logistics and seal the deal, eh? And I've got one more thing to show you. d -Goss. Okay. Kind of creepy how it's dark in here now. What's over here? I'm curious about this door. Nothing to say? Oh. 
Almost nailed it. Not me, the game, because I hit auto. <laughs> Let's head back upstairs, eh? I have one more thing to show you. Wait, we only came here looking for some answers about this stupid moldy computer. Oh, the old man in the cave with the moldy computer. That black mold. It's drawn to whiskey. It feeds on ethanol fumes, you see. As we age the whiskey, some of it inevitably evaporates into the air. The angel share. It goes through the vents here and out into the caves. If we can scrape up that mold, we can usually apply some pressure and coal to it, squeeze and condense the angel share back into drinkable whiskey. Every drop counts when you're making a living on the stuff. So we'd go down and scrape it off his equipment, just like any other place it grows. He kept sending his people here to drive us away. Paranoid. Truly paranoid. Well, now we have the formula, so we don't need to go collecting mold. But we didn't do anything to his moldy computer. He just forgot the password. One of his assistants shared it with me. Dome in air. That'll get you going. I'm sure of it. So, join me upstairs. When we were in the uh, Hall of the Mountain King, somebody else said dome in air. Oh my god, it's all coming to fruition. I don't like how dark it is. It's kind of spooky. If you don't mind. Oh yeah, we gotta go put our equipment back. Why am I walking so slowly? Well, not me. Why is he walking so slowly? I mean, I know I'm controlling him, but the only person who am I is Conway. Here it is. A beauty, wouldn't you say? It's an antique, you know. What is it? Why, it's an adding machine. This is where we come for our daily ritual, to calculate the day's interest and repayment according to the formula. I usually do so at the beginning of my shift, so I know how many hours I need in order to keep up. Yes, I believe you'll do well here, sir. Happy to have you. Congratulations. You're hired. Wait, we can't... It's customary here to start each day with a shift drink. Let's make it special. Mark the occasion. This is the top shelf stuff now. Single barrel. He doesn't... Down the hatch. Venum memoriae mors. I don't want him to drink that. I don't want him to drink that. Yeah, okay. I didn't touch anything. Wait, why is he drinking it anyway? <gasps> Conway! Decent enough. Welcome aboard. He's not working for you. We have to go back to this... Our... He has a delivery to make. What's this? Not working? Are you turning down this opportunity? Uh, she's right. I have to make this, uh... I'm... Disappointed. And I'm afraid that leaves us with a delicate problem. As I indicated, this is the top-shelf stuff you're drinking now. It isn't cheap. If it's not your first shift drink, well, and there's the matter of this tour just now, my time and experience are billed at quite a premium. This is not good for you, my friend. You're in quite deep by my back-of-the-envelope estimations. Well, we have that in common, I suppose. All of us. Yes, I'm afraid you'll have to work this off somehow. It's just the way of it. What's happening right now? You can start tomorrow. Take the time to settle your affairs. Of course, the interest begins to compound immediately, and... Well, we'll go over the formula when you get here. I should get back to work. See you tomorrow, then. What the absolute fuck? Okay. Also, did that skeleton have a little purse hanging off its shoulder? <laughs> so... I guess I start in the morning. I guess... I'm confused. It's just the way these things go, kid. Huh. Well, that still gives us a few hours to roam, right? Where's that ferry? And right on cue for me to end the episode. Also, that gave me very little nightmares vibes. There's the ferry, but I kind of don't want to get on it. What the hell? Excuse me, elephant? End of act three.
All right. Oh my God, I love this. <laughs> I love this so much. I don't know how many different ways I can say this. This developer gave me something that I will remember until the end of my days. And that's something wonderful if you can say that about a game, because I can't. I've played thousands upon thousands of games over the course of my life. And I remember maybe a dozen of them, you know, vividly. And the rest, I just remember little fragments. Kentucky Route Zero, I'll remember that till the cows come home. And if you'll remember me, till the cows come home, <laughs> then go ahead and subscribe to my channel, support me on Patreon at the $1 tier or higher, and I'll be back soon with another episode of Kentucky Route Zero.